File 5. Chapter 5. The reader may please to observe that the following extract of many conversations I had with my master contains a summary of the most material points which were discoursed at several times for above two years, his honour often desiring fuller satisfaction as I further improved in the Hunanum tongue. I laid before him, as well as I could, the whole state of Europe. I discoursed of trade and manufactures, of arts and sciences, and the answers I gave to all the questions he made, as they arose upon several subjects, were a fund of conversation not to be exhausted. But I shall here only set down the substance of what passed between us concerning my own country, reducing it into order as well as I can, without regard to time or other circumstances, while I strictly adhere to truth. My only concern is that I shall hardly be able to do justice to my master's arguments and expressions, which must needs suffer by my want of capacity, as well as by a translation into our barbarous English. In obedience, therefore, to his honour's commands, I related to him the revolution under the Prince of Orange, the long war with France entered into by the said Prince, and renewed by his successor the present Queen, wherein the greatest powers of Christendom were engaged, and which still continued. I computed, at his request, that about a million of Yahoos might have been killed in the whole progress of it, and perhaps a hundred or more cities taken, and five times as many ships burnt or sunk. He asked me what were the usual causes or motives that made one country go to war with another. I answered they were innumerable, but I should only mention a few of the chief. Sometimes the ambitions of princes, who never think they have land or people enough to govern. Sometimes the corruption of ministers, who engage their master in a war in order to stifle or divert the clamour of the subjects against their evil administration. Difference in opinion has cost many millions of lives. For instance, whether flesh be bread or bread be flesh, whether the juice of a certain berry be blood or wine, whether whistling be a vice or a virtue, whether it be better to kiss a post or throw it into the fire, what is the best colour for a coat, whether black, white, red or grey, and whether it should be long or short, narrow or wide, dirty or clean, with many more. Neither are any wars so furious and bloody, or of so long continuance, as those occasioned by difference of opinion, especially if it be in things indifferent. Sometimes the quarrel between two princes is to decide which of them shall dispossess a third of his dominions, where neither of them pretend to any right. Sometimes one prince quarrels with another, for fear the other should quarrel with him. Sometimes a war is entered upon because the enemy is too strong, and sometimes because he is too weak. Sometimes our neighbours want the things which we have, or have the things which we want, and we both fight till they take ours or give us theirs. It is a very justifiable cause of war to invade a country after the people have been wasted by famine, destroyed by pestilence, or embroiled by factions amongst themselves. 
It is justifiable to enter into a war against our nearest ally, when one of his towns lies convenient for us, or a territory or land that would render our dominions round and compact. If a prince send forces into a nation where the people are poor and ignorant, he may lawfully put half of them to death and make slaves of the rest, in order to civilize and reduce them from their barbarous way of living. It is a very kingly, honorable, and frequent practice when one king desires the assistance of another to secure him against an invasion, that the assistant, when he has driven out the invader, should seize on the dominions himself and kill him prison or banish the prince he came to relieve. Alliance by blood or marriage is a frequent cause of war between princes, and the nearer the kindred is, the greater is their disposition to quarrel. Poor nations are hungry, and rich nations are proud, and pride and hunger will ever be at variance. For these reasons, the trade of a soldier is held the most honourable of all others, because a soldier is a yahoo hired to kill in cold blood as many of his own species who have never offended him as he possibly can. There is likewise a kind of beggarly princes in Europe, not able to make war by themselves, who hire out their troops to richer nations for so much a day to each man, of which they keep three-fourths to themselves, and it is the best part of their maintenance. Such are those in many northern parts of Europe. "'What you have told me,' said my master upon the subject of war, does indeed discover most admirably the effects of that reason you pretend to. However, it is happy that the shame is greater than the danger, and that nature has left you utterly incapable of doing much mischief. For your mouths lying flat with your faces, you can hardly bite each other to any purpose, unless by consent— then, as to the claws upon your feet, before and behind, they are so short and tender that one of our yahoos would drive a dozen of yours before him, and therefore, in recounting the numbers of those who have been killed in battle, I cannot but think you have said the thing which is not. I could not forbear shaking my head, and smiling a little at his ignorance. And being no stranger to the art of war, I gave him a description of cannons, culverins, muskets, carbines, pistols, bullets, powder, swords, bayonets, battles, sieges, retreats, attacks, undermines, countermines, bombardments, sea-fights, ships, sunk with a thousand men, twenty thousand killed on each side, dying groans, limbs flying in the air, smoke, noise, confusion, trampling to death under horses' feet, flight, pursuit, victory, fields strewed with carcasses left for food to dogs and wolves and birds of prey, plundering, stripping, burning and destroying. And, to set forth the valour of my own dear countrymen, I assured him that I had seen them blow up a hundred enemies at once in a siege, and as many in a ship, and beheld the dead bodies drop down in pieces from the clouds, to the great diversion of all the spectators. I was going on to more particulars, 
when my master commanded me silence. He said, Whoever understood the nature of Yahoo's might easily believe it possible for so vile an animal to be capable of every action I had named, if their strength and cunning equalled their malice. But as my discourse had increased his abhorrence of the whole species, so he found it gave him a disturbance in his mind to which he was wholly a stranger before. He thought his ears, being used to such abominable words, might by degrees admit them with less detestation, that although he hated the yahoos of this country, yet he no more blamed them for their odious qualities than he did a gunya, a bird of prey, for its cruelty, or a sharp stone for cutting his hoof. But when a creature pretending to reason could be capable of such enormities, he dreaded lest the corruption of that faculty might be worse than brutality itself. He seemed confident that instead of reason we were only possessed of some quality fitted to increase our natural vices, as the reflection from a troubled stream returns the image of an ill-shapen body not only larger, but more distorted. He added that he had heard too much upon the subject of war, both in this and some further discourses. There was another point which a little perplexed him at present. I had informed him that some of our crew left the country on account of being ruined by law that I had already explained the meaning of the word, but he was at a loss how it should come to pass that the law, which was intended for every man's preservation, should be any man's ruin. Therefore he desired to be further satisfied what I meant by law, and the dispensers thereof, according to the present practice in my own country, because he thought nature and reason were sufficient guides for a reasonable animal, as we pretended to be, in showing us what we ought to do and what to avoid. I assured his honour that law was a science in which I had not much conversed, further than by employing advocates in vain upon some injustices that had been done me. However, I would give him all the satisfaction I was able. I said there was a society of men among us, bred up from their youths in the art of proving, by words multiplied for the purpose, that white is black and black white, according as they are paid. To this society all the rest of the people are slaves. For example— if my neighbour has a mind to my cow, he hires a lawyer to prove that he ought to have my cow from me. I must then hire another to defend my right, it being against all rules of law that any man should be allowed to speak for himself. Now in this case I, who am the right owner, lie under two great disadvantages. First, my lawyer, being practised almost from his cradle in defending falsehoods, is quite out of his element when he would be an advocate for justice, which, as an unnatural office, he always attempts with great awkwardness, if not with ill will. The second disadvantage is that my lawyer must proceed with great caution, or else he will be reprimanded by the judges, and abhorred by his brethren as one that would lessen the practice of the law. And therefore I have but two methods to preserve my cow. The first is to gain over my adversary's lawyer with a double fee, who will then betray his client by insinuating that he has justice on his side— the second way is for my lawyer to make my cause appear as unjust as he can, 
by allowing the cow to belong to my adversary, and this, if it be skilfully done, will certainly bespeak the favour of the bench. Now your honour is to know that these judges are persons appointed to decide all controversies of property, as well as for the trial of criminals, and picked out from the most dexterous lawyers who have grown old or lazy, and having been biased all their lives against truth and equity, lie under such a fatal necessity of favouring fraud, perjury, and oppression, that I have known some of them refuse a large bribe from the side where justice lay, rather than injure the faculty by doing anything unbecoming their nature or their office. It is a maxim among these lawyers that whatever has been done before may legally be done again, and therefore they take special care to record all the decisions formerly made against common justice and the general reason of mankind. These, under the name of precedents, they produce as authorities to justify the most iniquitous opinions and the judges never fail of directing accordingly. In pleading, they studiously avoid entering into the merits of the cause, but are loud, violent, and tedious in dwelling upon all circumstances which are not to the purpose. For instance, in the case already mentioned, they never desire to know what claim or title my adversary has to my cow, whether the said cow were red or black, her horns long or short, whether the field I graze her in be round or square, whether she were milked at home or abroad, what diseases she's subject to, and the like, after which they consult precedents, adjourn the cause from time to time, and in ten twenty or thirty years come to an issue. It is likewise to be observed that this society has a peculiar cant and jargon of their own, that no other mortal can understand, and wherein all their laws are written, which they take special care to multiply, whereby they have wholly confounded the very essence of truth and falsehood, of right and wrong, so that it will take thirty years to decide whether the field left me by my ancestors for six generations belongs to me or to a stranger three hundred miles off. In the trial of persons accused for crimes against the state, the method is much more short and commendable. The judge first sends to sound the disposition of those in power, after which he can easily hang, or save a criminal, strictly preserving all the forms of law. Here my master, interposing, said it was a pity that creatures endowed with such prodigious abilities of mind as these lawyers, by the description I gave of them, must certainly be, were not rather encouraged to be instructors of others in wisdom and knowledge. In answer to which, I assured his honour that in all points out of their own trade they were usually the most ignorant and stupid generation among us, the most despicable in common conversation, avowed enemies to all knowledge and learning, and equally disposed to pervert the general reason of mankind in every other subject of discourse, 